Can you, can you help me out with our, our, our title of our, our message series right now? Can you say what? Say, come on, you're getting it pretty good. Do it again. Say, see, say what is an expression of surprise that what someone just said. And if you weren't here for the last few weeks, you, in order to say, say what, you have to raise the, the last part of that. What? Like you're a 14-year-old middle school girl. You know what I'm saying? So say it one more time. Say what? Say, see, I believe that there's moments in Scripture that if we would just apply what Jesus said, that there would be say what moments that'll shape our faith. There'll be say what moments that, that mold who we are. I'm telling you, one day, somebody's gonna be standing outside or inside, and, the, and Jesus is gonna return, you know what I'm saying? And they're gonna see bodies flying into the air, and, and we're gonna meet the Lord in the air, and they're gonna go, say what? I missed it. They'll run to the church, grab a Bible, and try to figure out how in the world am I going to make it after this. But thank God that you're in a place where you can believe. How many believe? How many love Jesus? Do you believe? See, our goal this year is to grow your faith. We don't want to just do church, have nice programs, and and make us feel good when we leave this place and have a motivational talk where, where you can walk out and feel good about yourself until Wednesday and then you gotta come back to feel good about yourself again, you know what I'm saying? We don't wanna just do church, we wanna be the church. Because Jesus said this, he said, I will build my church. And guess what? He's not stopped building it. Aren't you glad that he's not stopped building it? So when we, do the, when we, we talk about say what moments, I want you to look in Luke chapter five in verse one, we're gonna read through this story uh, that Jesus inter, inter, intersects with, with some of the disciples in the very early days. And, and uh, if you're taking notes, you can look in the YouVersion app or you can look in the church app and the notes are there for you. But in Luke chapter five, verse one, it says this, one day, everyone say one day. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the, water edge, at the water's edge, two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Can you say what? Say, come on, do that again. Say what? Say, boy, first service is louder. Can you do that again? Say what? Come on, help your pastor out. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Say, I'll do that one more time, say. Simon answered, I, Master, we've worked hard all night long and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that the boat, that their nets began to break. So they signaled to the partners in the other boat to come and to help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Verse eight, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. Can you say what? Say so they pulled their boats up on shore. They left everything. They left the boat. They left their nets. They left the fish. They left their family. They walked away from everything to do what? Follow Jesus. So today, God, I pray, Lord, that you would just seal this word in our hearts, speak to us in a personal way. God, I pray, Lord, that you would challenge us and encourage us. May we walk out of this room with, with greater faith, but God, may we walk out of this room with more. Jesus, we want more of you. Pour your life into us in a greater way in these next few moments, God. In Jesus' name, if you love him, come on, can you clap for the word today? Hey, not all the it's not all the time that we have some pastor friends that are in the church today. John Code, which was our kid's pastor, if you don't know who he is, the guy in the teal that came up, not the guy in the bunny suit, that was our worship pastor, but the other guy, he is our kid's pastor. Aren't you thankful for an amazing kid's pastor that works with 150 plus kids every Sunday? Your kids, aren't you thankful that, that God has put a great couple with your kids? 
But his brother and his family are here in town. Can you give it up for Steve and Kristen Code? Can you just thank God they're pastors, west coast of Florida. They're doing an amazing work. If you want to see them, you can see them afterward. They're on this side of the room. But, but the main idea of this, this whole series that we're in is if he said it. See, if he said it, he can do it. If he said it, we should follow it. If he said it, there's absolutely no limit to what he can do. The only limitation is our willingness to follow, our willingness to apply it, our willingness to just simply do what he said to do. Now, I don't know about you, when they look at these disciples, they were there, and the one thing that Peter said, he said, we have worked hard all night long. How many work hard? Come on, how many, wave at me if you work hard at life. Come on, how many believe in a working hard ethic? Like, you like believe in, it's a good thing to work hard. Wave at me, okay, wave at me, there you go. I don't know about you, but I grew up, somebody's like shaking his head the other way, you know. I like to laugh. Listen, I'm telling you, when I grew up, my dad, whoo, he taught us what working hard was all about. I'm telling you, we didn't have a choice. We had to work. And uh, I remember one of my first jobs that I had, I actually worked for about three months for this, this uh, camper sales place called Robin's Camper Sales in, in Ormond Beach. I was the groundskeeper. Think of this. You know, the pastor was the groundskeeper. I mowed grass. I weeded everything, I edged everything, I sprayed every weed, I pulled every weed. I'm telling you, they had this huge lot with like 40 or 50 campers on it they were selling and it was all white gravel and these stinging nettles would pop up all the time. If you don't know what those are, you reach down and grab one, it'll reach back and grab you in a, in a huge way. And we just like take a shovel and with a, uh, all day long, I mean, just pulling these weeds. They never stop growing, that's the devil. Them weeds, I'm telling you. Some of you got them weeds in your yard, you know what I'm saying? Roundup. <laughs> but when it comes to, they didn't, have, they didn't use Roundup back then. They used manual <laughs> labor. <laughs> so I actually, then they had this huge storage lot with like a hundred of these campers. People would pay to store, but it was all grass. So I had to mow that, mow the front, weed this, edge this, blow up this. You'd start on Monday at seven in the morning and at Friday at three o'clock in the afternoon, you'd look at what you did and it grew. It grew back. On Monday, you'd go back and do the same thing over and over and over. I mowed around those trailers all summer long, every week going back and forth. It was mindless. I, I, let, let me help you out. I did not want to do it at all. But in the middle of the heat of summer, Something clicked. I realized something. Wait a minute. I'm made for more. I don't have to do this. God's got a plan for my life. I'm looking around going, I am not staying in this rental lot or whatever. I am not going to do this thing with my life. I am thankful. I'm like, there's something inside of me that said, there has to be more. Here's the question we want to we try to answer today is this. What do you do? When you work hard at what you do, in the middle of it, you realize there has to be more. What do you do in the process of just trying to live out your faith and work out your faith and, and work out living and everything, and you are working hard at doing it? There are some people in this room that I know what you do, and I know the effort that you put in what you do, and you work extra hard to do what you do. There was a lady in the first service that works the graveyard shift, you know what I'm saying? She got up at seven o'clock this morning, drank a bunch of coffee, and she was in the first service. You know what that is? That is working hard for your family and making what? Church a priority. Isn't that something to be celebrated? Come on now. <laughs> See, when we work hard at what we do, sometimes there's that frustration level of thinking, well, there has to be more. The problem is you have to realize this. You have to, you have to just own up to the fact that you're made for more. So say this with me. Say, say I am. Come on, say it like you believe it. Say, I am, I am. Made, for more. made for more. Say this. Because more lives in me. Now celebrate for a minute. Okay, come on now. The moment that you realize that the creator of the universe didn't choose to live in a building, but chose to live in people, the moment that I gave my life to Christ, more took up residence in me. More became, became living in me. And when I start focusing on what's inside of me, that's when I start seeing that there is no limitation to what he can do and what he will do. Why? Because I am meant for more. Because he has got an amazing plan. Because his plan is greater than I can ever imagine. Look at it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter two. In verse nine, it says this. 
No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. How many love Jesus? Come on, clap if you love Jesus. So more is greater than what I've ever seen, greater than what I've ever heard, greater than what I can ever imagine, and it's already prepared in advance. That means he's got it set up and it's ready. The problem is we put a limitation on it, and when we put a limitation on it, we decide I can't have more because the conditions aren't right. I can't have more because I'm stuck in this place. But at some point, we have to have enough faith. So I'm gonna step out from where I am, and I'm gonna start walking towards Jesus. And I'm gonna do what? I'm gonna do what the disciples did. I'm gonna follow him because he has a plan. He is my source. He is my provider. If he has more, giddy up, I'm going with him. How many are going with him today? Come on now. So when we look at this story, we realize, you know, wait a minute. There is more in the story. But the moments that we look through the story that are going to help us in this situation is this. The first moment that I see is this. This is an inconvenient moment. How many love inconvenient moments? Not too many of us. We don't like to be inconvenienced. We, we, we plan our life around this thing called convenience. We can go to Publix now, and we can go to Target now, and we can order it online, and we can pull up into a spot and sit there. And some joker will bring it out and put it in your car for you. Isn't that amazing? You know what they're doing? They have marketed you. They don't want to lose you. They'll do everything they can to get in your pocket. Why? Because they're going to develop everything they possibly can around your convenience. See, there's an app for everything. There's an app to get small. There's an app to get big. There's an app to get stronger. There's an app to find out what the best food in, in town is. There's an app to find anything and everything whenever there's a traffic, whenever there's anything and everything. Why? Because we build our lives around this thing called convenience. But if you filled your faith around convenience, if you mold your faith around your convenience, then you'll live like a lot of people live. Now that they say the statistics show us that, that, that most church people, now you're not most church people. Now clap for you because you understand what I'm saying. You're like, Pastor, that's a setup. Here you go. Most church people in, in society today will attend church once every five weeks and they are highly engaged people. The reason why they're highly engaged is because they have an iPhone or a smartphone, not a dumb phone or, or anything, and they're like online. They're a group of people that are, that are out of town right now, and they texted me and said, we are watching the service. Go, can we get, welcome them to the service, you know what I'm saying? Why we feel like we can be connected in every possible way. So what happens on Easter when everyone wakes up and says, wait, I'm connected to that place, and you look at the room now, and you go, Pastor, you're only doing two. Why? I'm gonna take up, I'm gonna put as many chairs in this place, take up some boots. We're gonna pack the place to the hill. Why? Because we want people to see that God is doing more. Why? Because we believe that God's got so much more. What is, are you gonna inconvenient people? No, I'm gonna put a donut wall out there. You can consume as many donuts as you want and wait for the second experience, you know what I'm saying? You're gonna be able to drink your coffee, get a picture, come in, get your donut, get your sugar on, so that you come in and you're like, woo! He's alive in me. No, that's coffee and sugar, okay? <laughs> but it does help. How many think it helps? Clap one time. There you go. All right, so inconvenient moment. You look at this, this passage, you realize that, that Jesus is teaching, and this group of people come up, and they start pushing him to the edge of this water, and then he looks over, and he sees these two boats that were left. There was nobody in the boat, but he looks down, and he sees these guys, and they're doing what? They're washing their nets. They're getting ready for the next night of fishing. They're doing everything that they can. Why? Because that's their business. They're not pleasure fishermen. They're not the people that are posting on Instagram, look at my redfish, right, David? Look at this baby, you know what I'm saying? And you're like, is that legal? I don't know if they kept it or not kept it, you know what I'm saying? They show all these fish, and I'm like, which one did you keep? None of them, because I want to keep my boat, you know what I'm saying? When, it come, when they're not those type of fishermen, they're the type of fishermen that are like, if we don't have any food in the boat, if we don't have any fish in the boat, then we may not eat this week because that's how we provide for our family. They had to provide for their family. They were professional fishermen. So Jesus looks down and he sees them. What does he do? He takes a step into the boat and he calls Simon and says, hey, Simon, it's your boat. Now think of this. Somebody steps in your boat 
and there is a crowd of people that are surrounding them and they're teaching, what do you do? You walk over and you get in the boat with them, you know what I'm saying? You're like, he gets in the boat with him, he goes, hey, can you put off the shore a little bit? He sits down and starts teaching. Simon's sitting there listening to everything he does. This is an inconvenient moment. Why? Because he was busy. He's over here doing his thing. He was working hard. He was cleaning his nets. He was getting ready. Why? Because he had to make money. He had to provide for his family. He had to do what he had to do. But you know what Jesus did? Jesus showed up at an inconvenient time and wanted what he had in order to declare to the people on the shore that this is where the hope is. Sometimes Jesus will interrupt your life. And my prayer is that this week he interrupts your regularly scheduled program, your life, your plan, so that he can use what you have in order to reach somebody with the gospel. Somebody this week is gonna receive an invitation from you, and it's not gonna be convenient. Inconvenient means I gotta get out of my house, go across the street, knock on the door, and hope that somebody's there, because nobody knocks on your door, unless it's the UPS guy and sometimes the Amazon people. I had one scare me yesterday, like walked in my garage, hey, and they had packages, and I'm like, Whoa, it's Christmas, you know what I'm saying? I don't know. I'm like, are all those for me? And I'm like, no, they're not. <laughs> Amazon, hello, they're scaring people now, dropping their packages off. For some of you, you gotta, you gotta realize that the most inconvenient thing is to, is to go to work and bring some of these. And then you gotta realize, what am I gonna do with these? Some people, they take them to the bathroom and they set them in strategic places. I took mine to Chick-fil-A this week. You know, they got those table things that have those plastic things where they put all those advertisements in. If you work for Chick-fil-A, I'm sorry. But um, I, stick it, I stuck mine in there. They couldn't pull it up. I put them in gas stations and the plastic things are up to the thing. Why? Because somebody's coming to get gas. You know what I'm saying? Someone needs to, like, while they're filling gas, they're looking up going, hope is here. Are you kidding me? Pull that baby out and start reading it. For some of us, we've got to realize that there's somebody that needs to have a personal invitation. And you know something? That will be inconvenient for you. Can I help you out? Faith is almost never convenient. Faith is almost never work out in, in your, your so-called schedule. We get so busy sometimes doing life that we fail to remember that, that life lives in us. Jesus lives in us, the creator of the universe. The way, the truth, and the life lives in us. So if we get so busy doing life, we fail to remember that life living in us wants to impact the world. You know what that is? That's called a greater purpose. The first job that I ever had, I got when I was 14 years old. And I worked um, for public supermarkets, of all things. I was a bag boy, hello, <laughs> back in the day. I mean, I'm, I was 14 years old, and I actually, this is not a good thing, but I actually, back then, they didn't like online check out how old you were. They wanted to see a copy of your birth certificate. You know what I did? I edited that baby, hello? Because you're supposed to be 15 years old. And that guy's like, are you 15? Yes, sir. Are you 15? Yes, sir. Here's the paper. Are you 15? Yes, sir. Why? Because I had a greater purpose in mind. I needed to work. Why? Because I lived in a house where my dad said this. He said, son, if you want a car when you're 16, if you want to drive when you're 16, you're not driving my car when you're 16, you're not driving what I have, you are going to have to buy your own vehicle. And guess what? I believed him. I honestly believed that he, that, that he was not going to allow me to drive something that they had, that I had to go out and find something that I needed. So what I did is I said, where can I get a job? Now in 19, uh, let's not say when it was, but let's just make it clear, Back in that day, minimum wage was $2.85 an hour. And I did the math. And I figured out how many hours do I need to put in in order to come up with about $2,000 because I wanted a car. I just didn't want any car. I wanted a car. I didn't want any car. I ended up buying a truck. I ended up buying a long bed Toyota truck because I'd put surfboards in the back of it. We lived on the beach, and we would go to the beach all the time. I'm telling you, it was the most amazing car until I flipped it before my 17th birthday. My son's not here, so I don't talk about that. It's one of many cars that I totaled as a teenager. Hello? 
Some of your parents are like, oh, really? I'm like, oh yeah, I hit telephone poles. I hit other cars. I broke off a telephone pole. It was just one of those things that, that I was not like, I would be what the, the insurance company would consider a high risk because they dropped me and I had to go to somebody else to get insurance and it cost me $125 a month. And my dad said, you're paying for it. <laughs> And that's why I got the job at Robin's Camp for Sale, so I could drive the car. Why did I want to drive a car? Because I didn't want to ride around on a bike, and you can't go out on a date on a bike. I had a greater purpose in mind. I was, listen, I didn't want to work. I could care less about working. I wanted to go to the beach. I wanted to hang out at the beach. I didn't want to work. But if I wanted to drive, I had to inconvenience my life in order to receive what I really wanted to receive. In order to drive, I had to go through something. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you got to go through something in order to get to something. Some of us, are, we, we like, well, it's inconvenient. I'm going to put that thing on the burner, and I'm not going to step into it. When God says, sometimes you just got to get inconvenienced. What are the disciples doing? They're over here washing their nets. When they're washing their nets, they're doing what they, what if, what if that had said, come on, Jesus, not now. I'm busy. I'm watching Netflix. Hello? <laughs> it's a good excuse. No, it's not. I mean, come on. I'm, I've got, I've got to go do, the, I've got to go hunting or by base. I got to go clean my gun. I don't know what that is, but, but you know what I'm saying? Some people are like, come on, Jesus. I need, you know, like, this is not the best time for me. Can I help you out? When is the best time? Why do we wait until it's convenient? Why do we wait till the moment that, that we think, well, the condition has to be right? Why do we wait until we think, well, when it fits into my time, then I'm gonna do it? Can I help you out? Serving on a team at Easter is inconvenient. Why? Because we want you to serve one and sit one. Why? Because literally a thousand people will walk through these doors in a weekend and they need to run into not a pastor and a music pastor and a bunny. I don't think the bunny will be here, but, but I think what they need to run into is you. Why? Because nobody on the planet is going to physically see Jesus. But you know what they're going to see? They're going to see a follower of Christ. They're going to see somebody who loves Jesus. How many love Jesus? Come on now. So we got to get our eyes. See, if all we do is live our faith around convenience, then we'll show up when we feel like it. We'll show up when the weather's good. I, sometimes I love it when it rains in Florida. You know what I'm saying? On Sunday, I love it. I look at the weather sometimes like, the devil is a liar. Some people will stay home when it rains, but I think some people won't get in the boat when it rains. Hello? I want lightning to hit, rain to hit, just craziness. Why? Because they're not going to go to the beach. We live in the sunshine state. Hello? Okay, let's, let's hold on to that for a moment. Some of you are like, that's just uncomfortable. Can I help you out? Living, living with a greater purpose is inconvenient. But your faith will place a demand on your life that's not just inconvenient, but it's uncomfortable. The uncomfortable moment in this story is when Jesus asks the professional fisherman to do what he did all night long. To do it again and something would happen that didn't happen last night. He reaches out and says, hey, he preaches, he gets done, and he looks at him and he says, he says, uh, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon Peter could have said what? He could have said, what? Come on, say it with me. Say what? Say what? Now, when you read scripture, sometimes people read it in a holy way, and they read it in a real religious way. They read it like Peter's like, oh, master, master of the universe, who created everything on the planet. You are the divine. You are standing in front of me. So today, since you said, go ahead and let down my net. Where would you like me to put my nets? Would you like me to put my nets over here or over here? I would gladly put my nets down for you. Why? Because you are Jesus. You are the Messiah. That's not, you know, let, you got to read it like you would think you read it because I think he said, say what? Master, we have worked hard all night long and I don't see no fish and we're cleaning empty nets. But hey, <laughs> Because you said so. You ever say that to your parents? Because you said so. Sometimes parents like, so I've heard parents say this. I've never said this to my kids. Do what I say, not what I do. You know what I'm saying? Because I said so. <laughs> That's not good. You know what I'm saying? But Jesus like, let down your nets. 
for a catch. He didn't say let down your nets to catch some water. He said let down your nets and let's catch something. And Peter could have said, really? We worked hard? But because you said so, okay, we'll do it. Now the part you don't see is it doesn't say that they pushed out off the, off the shore. It doesn't say they moved the boat. I don't know if they moved the boat. I don't think it matters they moved the boat. What I think matters is the fact that Peter was the professional fisherman and the conditions in his mind were not right. The conditions in his mind were not the right time, not the right moment. He was tired, he was done, but Jesus was like, let down the nets. When are we going to stop considering, well, if it's inconvenient and it's uncomfortable, then it must not be God. When we look in scripture and he calls someone that in an inconvenient way, and he makes them uncomfortable, and they've worked hard, and they've said, God, do this. They they could have been praying, hey, Lord, touch my net, do something. Somebody in this room needs to hear this. You've been working hard, serving God, and doing all these different things, and your question in your head is, why am I walking through such a tough time? Why am I facing all these things? Listen, if Jesus is in the boat, then he can bring the greatest catch of all. The condition does not determine the miracle. The conditions were not right for the catch. The conditions were not great. It was in the middle of the day. He had been teaching. They were tired. They pushed off. And in the condition of that situation, they just simply followed what he said. See, faith living within you, you know what it does? It ignores the conditions around you. See, faith living inside of you when somebody is going through a tough time, there's something inside of you that should say, man, there is more. His name is Jesus. And that's the moment of faith you step out and say, okay, I'm going to do something. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to do what I can for you. At what point are you comfortable with your neighbor missing heaven? At At what point are we comfortable with someone that works 10 feet away from us, from missing eternity. Because I honestly believe that, that the reason why you are where you are today and where you are tomorrow is so that eternity can become a better place is so that a life can be impacted, not just by by a church, but impacted by your life, impacted by the Jesus that lives in you. Because more living in you isn't just for you, it's for everybody around you. So at some point, I gotta push away what I think is inconvenient, I gotta get uncomfortable a little bit, and I gotta realize that I am made for more. You know why? If he said it. Jesus said, Push out, let down the nets, and we'll have a great catch. The conditions, listen, the conditions may never be right. If you are waiting for the conditions to be right, for you to join a serve team, let me help you out. They may never be perfect for you. You may be, you're like, you know, I mean, I love, love, love listening to the stories of people that are in the struggle of life. They're in the struggle with their health. They're in the struggle with mental, mental just, just health. They're discouraged, they're beaten down different things, but they show up on a Sunday morning and they, they're at the coffee, they're under the tent, they're out in the parking lot, they're in the kids' ministry, they're serving as an usher, they're running a camera, they're doing what? They're doing what they can, and in doing what they can, what happens is God's the one who shows up in what? In what we do. See, these guys were cleaning their nets, and he said, can I get in your boat? Gets in their boat, and Jesus did what? He used what they had. It wasn't the right condition. You might think, well, I'm just gonna wait wait for everything to line up perfectly for me to step in and be used by God. And God's saying, I wanna use you right where you are. I wanna use you now. Why not now? Why not here? Why not you? And it comes to a point where we, we start putting conditions on how we can be used by him. And some of us just need to use our smile. Go ahead and smile one time. Some of you are like, that's so hard to do. You know, I mean, do you love walking into people that can't smile, you know what I'm saying? When people, when I walk up to, in the doctor's office, they're like, how you doing? That's the worst question to ask somebody when you're going to the doctor's office. My foot is in pain. I am dying here. That's what I want to tell. I look at her and say, life is good in Jesus' name. You know what that is? That's faith. 
Why? Because my foot's in pain. <laughs> my foot is killing me, lady. Come on, can you? She's like, go get an x-ray. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Go to get an x-ray. And then the doctor says, oh, nothing's broke. You know what I'm saying? And someone said, we think you got gout or something. I'm like, man, this sucker is hurting like crazy. You know what I'm saying? It swells up, goes down. Swells up, goes down. This is my personal problem. You know what I'm saying? The condition today would be better to put my foot up and say, okay, God, I'm going to let somebody else do it. That's what the conditions say. But there's a part of me that says, God, you put this in me so that I could give it to the people that are in front of me. So if I give it to you and I push beyond my, my inconvenience, if I push beyond my comfort zone and say, okay, God, I want to be where you are. And that's the point we have to step into and say, okay, Jesus, I'm going to do what the disciples did. I'm going to follow you. Why? Because when Jesus got into the boat, absolutely nothing was impossible. That's what you got to realize. When Jesus is in the boat, picture yourself as the, when G, when the moment that, you, that Jesus came to live in your life. That's the moment when breakthrough takes place. See, this breakthrough moment that these, these disciples had was life-changing and life rearranging and it was all about the day-to-day. It happened in the day-to-day. It happened in the busyness of the day. It happened when they were working hard to do what they were doing. See, they were there, and they, they, they did what? They cast the net out, and thinking, well, I'll just cast it out. Nothing's going to happen. And when they pulled the net back, what happened was the net started to break. Everyone say break. See, that's the moment that their eyes must have got really big, because when you read the scripture, it says they were astonished. They were marveled at how great the catch was. And the catch starts breaking the net. So they start waving at, the, at their other partners. You know what their other partners were? James and John, the Zebedee brothers that were followers of Jesus and disciples. You know where they probably were? Sitting on the shore laughing at the guys because they didn't catch any fish last night. But then when they started waving and they went out there and they started loading in the fish, guess what? The crowd was probably still next to the shore watching all this come down and they start loading the fish and the boats start to sink. You know what that tells me? My breakthrough moment is the moment that I realize that Jesus is my source. Jesus is where I live. Regardless of what's convenient, regardless of what's comfortable, Faith will cause me to step beyond those two boundaries because I'm following Jesus. And when I look at that story, my breakthrough moment is to realize that, you know, he could have provided for each of them just what they needed for that day. But that's not like Jesus. Remember the, the, the wedding, the beginning, of this, this, the beginning of this series? If you haven't heard it, go back. Where, where Jesus, they take these 30-gallon pots, there were six of them, they fill it with water, and he says, dip it and go take it to the master of the banquet. And when they dipped it, brought it over and poured it, there was what? 180 gallons of wine. They had already drank for a who knows how long, but there was 180 gallons. You know, what, you know what that tells me? He's the God of more. More than what just I need in that moment. He's the God of more than enough. So when they casted that net and that net filled up, they started sinking the boat. At this moment, Peter falls down. You gotta realize he is a professional fisherman. And the Bible says he falls down at Jesus' knees and he says, get away from me. I am a sinner. He is so astonished by what took place in the water. He believed he was the Messiah soon coming king he's like leave me because i'm a sinner god didn't show up in a little way he showed up in a breakthrough way for some of us you know what your breakthrough moment is your breakthrough moment is the moment that you let go of the net you don't know what's going to catch your breakthrough moment is the moment you start worshiping your breakthrough moment is the moment that you join a serve team your breakthrough moment is the moment that you sign up to go through the What's Next series. Your breakthrough is the, is the moment that you, you give for the first time. Because real breakthrough happens in, in young couples and families that realize, wait a minute, Jesus is my source. So my breakthrough happens the moment that I did what? 
the moment that I released it, absolutely nothing happened until they put off the shore and let down the net. They could have just, I'm gonna hold on to the net. You could put the fish in the boat. Go ahead, you're Jesus, you're the Messiah, put the fish in the boat. No, they let go of what they had. God filled it and more than enough took place. I don't know what you're walking through, but I just wanna encourage you. When Jesus is in the boat, the condition is always right for a miracle. When Jesus is in the boat, the condition is perfect for real life change to happen. You might think, man, I'm struggling, I'm working hard. I've got, I'm a single mom and I'm just trying to make ends meet. Guess what? Jesus is in the boat. Everything that you need is in the boat. He is more than enough. Why? Jesus is our source. He's our provider. He's our help. He's the one that says, hey, I've got a greater plan. He's the one that didn't die to fill a building. He died to live inside of us. So that what? So that more than enough lives in us. I am made for more. Why? Because more lives in me. How many know that more lives in you? Come on now. So I want to encourage you to close your eyes across the building. I just believe that, that breakthrough happens in moments that we choose to say, okay, God, I need you. It, it happens when we choose to say, okay, Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. It happens and, and miracles happen when we choose to put ourselves in the place where he is. So maybe today, maybe just maybe, your breakthrough is when you choose to worship. Your breakthrough is when you choose to step towards him. Your breakthrough is when Jesus becomes who he is. The son of the living God came with no limitations. He is your provider. Father, these next few moments, God, I thank you, Lord, that you're the provider. I thank you, God, that you are more than enough. I thank you, God, that, that Lord, when we sing this song, this word in this song, Jesus, it's been in my spirit all week. God, I thank you, Lord. Close your eyes across the building. I just wanna encourage you. If you need a breakthrough, if you need a miracle, if you need God to show up in a, in a, in a real way, if you need healing in your life, we sing these songs about healing and these songs are an anthem that says, God, you're my healer. I'd encourage you, close your eyes for a moment, slip up both hands right where you're sitting. You don't even have to stand. In a moment, I'll have you stand, but, but slip your hands as high as you can, and, and maybe this needs to be your song. If you're not in it, then I don't want it. Let all Thanks for watching. If you'd like to support this ministry, you can check us out at OceanwayAG.com and click the gift tab. Take the whole world, give me cheese.